Tai norėčiau dar sigi padėkoti, kad atvyko įrenginį ką mūsų kareivykė Afrikoje ir tas renginys organizuojamas trijų šalių Afriko, Užsienio reikalų ministerijos ir prašto apsaugos ministerijos. Ir prieš pradėdami renginį mes turime čia viceministrą, kuris norėtų tarti pasveikinimo žodį, tai prašom krašto apsaugos viceministras Vytautas Sumbasas. Labadiena, gerbėmi diskusijos dalyvę, iš tikro malonu jis visus čia pasveikinti. Manau, kad iš tikro diskusija labai svarbi, kągi mūsų kariai veikia Afrikoje. Jeigu Afrika dar kažkiek metų, prieš kažkiek metų buvo toks labai tolimas regionas, tai dabar jis pasidarė ir labai artimas ir mes ten iš tikro gan aktyviai dalyvaujam, Lietuva aktyviai dalyvauja. Noriu priminti jums, kad dabar tarptautinėse misijose ir operacijose Lietuva turi apie 140 karių, maždaug pusė iš jų yra įtrauktyje operacijas ir misijas Afrikos regione. Skaičius atrodytų nedidelis, bet žiūrint per kapitą, tai yra vienam gyventojui, kiek tenka pagal mūsų valstybės dydį ir skaičių, lyginant su sąjungininkais, mes esam tikrai labai, labai aukštoj ir geroj vietoj, dalyvaudami tarptautinėse operacijos ir misijose. Priminsiu trumpai operacijas ir misijas susijusias su Afrika, tai yra dvi mokymo misijos ir dvi operacijos Europos Sąjungos ir vieną jungtinių tautų. Jungtinių tautų minus Mamalija yra turbūt didžiausia, ten mūsų 39 kariai, o dviejose mokymo misijose Malija taip pat, Europos Sąjungos mokymo misijose Malija ir Centrinė Afrikos Respublikoje, mes turim po porą karių, ir operacijoje, Europos Sąjungos operacijoje Sofija, turim periodiškai besikeičiančią laivų apsaugos grupę 12 karių ir lygiai taip pat Atalanto Europos Sąjungos operacijoje, nukreiptoj prieš piratavimą mes irgi turim besikeičių 12 karių ir pastoviai ten būdinčių keletą karininkų. Taip, kad indėlis iš tikro nemažas, mes tuo džiaugiamės ir manom, kad dėmesys Afrika iš tikro ir dar auks, mes tik ką taip pat paskiriam ir vasarą pradės dirbti ekspertas NATO pietų krypties štabe Neapolyje, kaip tik Sahelioj skirtas žmogus, Sahelio regionui. Ir taip pat mes žinom, kad plėtojame vystomojo bendradarbiavimo projektai, taip kad vyksta tikrai toks smarkus, geras ir naudingas darbas palaikant taikar stabilumą šitame regione. Ladies and gentlemen, my pleasure to welcome of you today here in this event, very important event, what's the role of our troops in Africa. Despite that Lithuania is completely not a big country, but here in the region we are really facing big challenges in security area. And, uh, but notwithstanding that, we are involved in, in, in uh, other regions and really trying to bring stability and, and helping to bring stability and prosperity in African region too. So we are participating where and hope very much as, as we think that this region very important, uh, that stability in Africa influencing all the world, not only European Union, uh, and that uh, really at the moment uh, various terrorist groups generating and evaluating uh, instability where we are really, really increasing our, our troops in Africa and various countries. And I hope this discussion will bring a lot of new insights, opportunities and uh, will be very useful for, for Lithuania, for, for all of us. Uh, because it is discussions of experts and, and of course, part participants. And really, I, what I would like to say, just to wish a fruitful and useful discussion. Thank you very much for your participation here. Thank you, Achu. Uh, so now we switch to English. And um, mm, thank you one more time for coming. And uh, I won't take too much time. Uh, I'll just present myself and I'll present all, all the panelists. Uh, so uh, my name is Yurate. I'm a part of uh, co-organizers and uh, part of AFRICO. Um, and uh, I'm delighted to present uh, um, highly experienced speakers in our discussion. And uh, today we're going to discuss uh, about international missions and operations, and uh, what is the role of our troops, our Lithuanian troops in, in Africa, because uh, from time to time you can hear a question what actually we're doing in Africa, because 
for some people it, it looks very, very far away. And uh, actually it's not in, 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 in a way because the, the world is really global and everything is pretty close. A um, few facts before we start into, into discussion. Um, since, uh, um, since the beginning of the United Nations in uh, 1945, the uh, United Nations actually implemented 57 peacekeeping missions and uh, a lot of them uh, actually ended up in Africa. And uh, currently there are uh, seven peacekeeping missions uh, of UN in Africa and uh, Lithuania is taking part in peacekeeping missions from um, 1994 and from 2014 we're actually also helping in Africa. So we are not really new in this field and uh, um, in the beginning, we started from only a few people in, in Somalia, um, in, in, in Sofia, and uh, afterwards in Central Afri African Republic. And now um, we have 39 um, uh, soldiers in, in, in Mali. Uh, so it's a pretty big group and it's getting started like really serious. So uh, now I want to present uh, our panelists and I'll start from, uh, from Daniel and he's an uh, assistant professor in uh, George Mason University uh, from School of Conflict Analysis and uh, Conflict Resolution. And uh, he's also alumnus from University of Oxford. And uh, um, um, this is our uh, Agla Moroskaita. She's a security analyst and uh, a senior research uh, researcher in the University of Maryland, and um, she's also alumnus from uh, Paris Science Po University. And uh, David Schlekis, he's assistant professor in Vilnius University in International uh, uh, Institute of International Relations and Political Science. And uh, uh, one more lady, Neringa uh, Yotkaite Putrimene, she's a uh, head of United Nations and Global Policy Department in Ministry of Foreign Affairs of uh, Republic of Lithuania. And um, also uh, um, Karol Seleksa, and he's head of uh, International Relations and Operation Department in the Ministry of National Defense of Lithuania. And last but not least, uh, uh, Gintas Gumbris, he's a Navy officer and he also works in the Ministry of National Defense of uh, Republic of Lithuania. So um, now I'll let Daniel to take over and to do an um, introduction. Thank you very much. Um, I am delighted to be, to be here and I am impressed by the number of uh, people who have turned, turned out despite the uh, rather pleasant weather out there, so thank you for coming. Um, my second time in Lithuania and uh, I am loving it. Um, so I think um, part of my role is to sort of give an overview of um, conflict uh, and um, uh, peacekeeping missions uh, in Africa uh, and I think the various experts will, um, will also comment on their own uh, role as well. So when I was thinking, I thought a good place to start uh, with, uh, with this particular uh, sort of talk is to sort of ground some of the discussions that we'll be having today in uh, a bit of a historical uh, context. Because I think the danger sometimes when we come to discuss security uh, in, uh, in the global south, particularly in Africa, uh, is a tendency to see it as a contemporary issue. Uh, forgetting that there's a lot of roots and historical groundedness that needs to be understood. And this is important because before you can work in Africa or do conduct peacekeeping mission in Africa, you need to understand uh, the people in the continent, where they're coming from, the dynamics, uh, in order to avoid a situation where uh, one goes to work in Africa thinking Africa is still a country. Um, and so this is important. Uh, Africa always comes into popular imagination, certainly uh, in, in Europe and, and the West uh, more broadly, as a continent uh, that is at war against itself. 
This is often how Af Africa uh, is, uh, is depicted in popular imagination. Um, but it's important as well to realize that there have been two significant uh, events that have impacted on uh, the, uh, the evolution of uh, uh, the African people, uh, but in particular the perception of Africans as well. And those significant events, among many others, uh, uh, involve uh, 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 Europeans as well. So uh, Africa has had a long contact with Europe uh, and, and certainly uh, uh, peacekeeping mission is, is just a contemporary or a new phase of that. Uh, we would recall that uh, from about uh, the 14th century, Africa uh, experienced uh, the, uh, the brutal uh, reality of uh, slave trade uh, and uh, hit uh, with that uh, till about uh, the 19th century, and just as they were recovering um, from the slave trade with Haiti, becoming the first country uh, to ban slave trade, and uh, other countries like uh, Britain and France and, and, and the United States uh, uh, following on and, and, and intercepting slave trade uh, with countries like Liberia, or, uh, uh, Liberia and, 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 and Ethiopia becoming you know, one of the only few countries that, that never endured uh, uh, slave trade. Africa was hit again by colonialism. So 19th century, uh, we have just as the continent emerges from one thing, goes into another thing. So what I call the double jeopardy of slave trade and uh, colonialism. And for many years, Africans were uh, uh, slaves in their own particular uh, uh, country. Uh, so it's important to ground this then uh, in, in that reality and to, and to realize that this is a continent that is still struggling to come to terms uh, with what it means to have a national identity because people were brought together that had no reason to be together. And oftentimes this has formed the basis of a lot of the conflict that has happened. Uh, in a context where we still talk about not just post-colonialism, we talk about neo-colonialism, we talk about uh, former colonial masters, uh, we talk about former colonial masters still having impact in having a huge say in the political uh, situation in Africa. And so why is this important? This is important because even as a country like Lithuania begins to engage more and more with Africa, I think Lithuanians should be concerned about how they, their presence has been perceived uh, on the ground. And this is very important because in engaging in conflict resolution or peacekeeping mission, you also put yourself in a space where people will begin to perceive you in a certain way, and it's important to understand where those people are coming from. And so you realize that your reputation, your perception uh, is going to change as you go engage more and more with certain parts of Africa. Now, Africa, post-colonial Africa, has been plagued by uh, various conflict. Um, you take the example of Nigeria, uh, which is native to me, um, the British left Nigeria in 1960, um, and Nigeria became an independent uh, country. But in 1967 to 1970, we had a civil war where over one million people were killed. But Nigeria, unfortunately, is, 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 is representative of many other African countries that quickly degenerated into brutal civil war uh, uh, post-colonial times. And we know as well uh, that Africa was also greatly impacted by the Cold War, uh, uh, where there was a sort of re-scramble scramble for Africa uh, uh, with the Soviet taking one side and the US the other side. So this is important as well to, to, to understand. And so Africa has been hit by issues of terrorism more recently. Uh, uh, of course, the more perennial ethnic uh, uh, and religious uh, conflict that continues to plague the continent, uh, the usual suspect of corruption, uh, 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 piracy, uh, oil bunkering, uh, and uh, generally uh, poverty, uh, which, which, is, which is a negative perception that has come to characterize uh, 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 what Africa is or how people perceive Africa. Even people that have had no engagement with Africa, have never met an African on a one-to-one -one basis, already have uh, a complete picture or what, of what that Africa is. So already even the concept of Africa has to begin from deconstructing a lot of the myth, stereotypes, and biases that emerges and often uh, 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 prevents 
uh, uh, people who have not had historically have engagement with, with Africans from engagement with them from a position of, 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 uh, of, of nuance, from a position uh, that, that takes them as agents, not just subjects. Uh, so it's not so much about uh, often what, uh, uh, what to do for Africa, which, which it, it, going with that mentality almost re-echoes the sort of missionary uh, uh, perception of going into a dark continent and bringing light to that continent. To realize that it's about working with, not for, or on behalf of, uh, of Africa, because Africans are agents and, and can take control and need for there to be sustainable peace and sustainable development, Africa must become agents of their own development. And that must resonate uh, even in powerful spaces uh, in the global north. So it's important for us to understand that going into Africa is going to alter your reputation and your perception of who you are uh, for better or worse. And this, this is important to engage with that reality but also to know that who you align yourself with in Africa as well, given the diversity, whether it's Fran Francophone Africa or Anglico Anglophone Africa, echoes certain memories that go way back to slave trade and also uh, colonialism. So again, it's about understanding uh, your positionality and what, how people will perceive a Lithuanian person uh, in Mali, as opposed to in Nigeria, as opposed to in Cote d'Ivoire. This is important uh, as well. Um, but we also know that um, one of the things I study is in northeastern Nigeria, there has been uh, what many of you understand as Boko Haram. And many of you knew about Boko Haram through the kidnapping of over 276 girls in April 2014. This is a crisis that has become very significant in particular for the European Union because of the crisis uh, uh, internally displaced people. Over two million people are displaced in a region that borders the Lake Chad Basin that includes uh, northeastern Nigeria, Cameroon, Niger, and Chad. But this is a region as well that has been plagued by environmental crisis. We know that Lake Chad itself was the biggest lake in the world in the 1960s, but it has shrunk almost 90% of its size. And so people have tended, people in that region are historically farmers, they are cattle rearers, they are fishermen, and they've moved with a shrinking lake, further blurring whatever distinction there are within boundaries. So you've had that crisis going on in northeastern Nigeria, resulting in a sort of regional response, which is called the Multinational Joint Task Force, forces that compose of Nigeria, Cameroon, Niger, and Chad, and Benin, which is close by. But you look into that again, and you move into, uh, into countries that form the Mano River Basin, Cote d'Ivoire, Guinea, Liberia, and Syria alone. We know that there has been uh, armed insurgencies and, and ethno-political extremism that are also going on there. And we know most recently there has been the Tuareg, Tuareg Rebellion that has been going on there, but this is partly in response as well to some of the crises that have happened in Libya, uh, where all of a sudden in displacing a powerhouse in Muammar Gaddafi, there has been a power vacuum uh, and the displacement of soldiers and arsenals that have also intensified conflict uh, in places like uh, Mali. And you move beyond Mali and you go into uh, Somalia and, and, and the Horn of Africa, there's another insurgency going on in, 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 in the Al-Shabaab uh, insurgency. And we know how that is perceived, uh, uh, how Al-Shabaab have moved from being a youth wing of the Islamic Court Union to being this radical group uh, uh, that terrorizes uh, the local population. But it's important as well ways in which Al-Shabaab thrives on the notion that people from the outside are coming to invade their territory. The very notion that Boko Haram's name implies, which means Western education is seen. So Al-Shabaab sees Ethiopia, what is Ethiopia coming into Somalia as an invasion of their own space. And this is why they have increasingly targeted the African Union mission in Somalia, the AFRISO. So this is important to see ways in which one's presence can be appropriated on the ground as a way of rallying people around. And so it's important uh, when we understand issues of the global war on terror, when we understand issues of peacekeeping missions, and that we understand also ways in which these can sometimes play into, into the hands of terrorist groups uh, and how they can appropriate this discourse in order to uh, recruit more followers, uh, uh, in order to say, see, they are always invading our territory, so we need to do something about that. So uh, I guess my call is to try to understand, uh, first understand uh, the dynamism of Africa and understand that Africa is not a country. So the diverse, diverse place of many languages, many cultures, and so uh, uh, that understanding can then inform better response uh, to, to the people of Africa. 
I will leave it there and, um, okay, you have the mic, I'll pass it on. Uh, okay, thank you, Daniel, Thanks. for introduction. And uh, I'd like to pick uh, from here and to, to ask Gedra Moroskait, and she's uh, Agnes Moroskait, and she's a security, a global security analyst. Uh, what about global security context uh, in general, and also um, a bit more in particular, what is the situation in Africa and security fields now, and maybe a bit more uh, about uh, Western interests in 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 African region now? Thank you. Right, so thank you for the opportunity to speak to you here this evening. After Daniel did a very sort of on point overview of Africa as not a country in 10 minutes, my task of reviewing global great power interests in three minutes, I'm not sure I can cope with it as effectively, but I'll do, I'll do my best, right? So uh, some real quick remarks before the general discussion along three axes. Uh, peacekeeping missions in general, great power politics in general, and how that pertains to Africa and sort of the in particular. Uh, and uh, well, a lot of my work and analysis uh, concerns the part of Africa that falls into the concept of MENA, Middle East and North Africa. So those are the areas most directly influenced and talked about when you think about uh, terrorism, when you think about Arab Spring, when you think about spillover effects, but certainly uh, the notions that Daniel brings up, uh, forced migration, uh, returning fighters, uh, the further dilute dilution of borders and the problems of nationalism and being treated as an object of great power politics, certainly that is, those are the issues that do describe the continent as a whole as well. So just real quick, some remarks about the peacekeeping missions to perhaps start uh, laying the grounds or, or rather throwing some nails on the ground before the discussion starts of what Lithuanians are doing there. So back in the day when I was a student at Sian's Po, we talked about various things to do with peace. And so that was peacekeeping, peacemaking, peace building. Uh, and, uh, you know, all those concepts had very different things, uh, to, some to do with troops, some to do with NGO workers, some to do with economic development. Uh, and uh, those, uh, what, what, I'm, what I want to emphasize by bringing that up is that peace, uh, continuous peace, or at least stability in any given space, be it Lithuania, be it Africa, or be it the U.S., it is a broad concept that, ha that unfolds over long term and involves socioeconomic phenomena, such as uh, you know, opportunities for education, healthcare, uh, and gainful employment, as much as uh, absence of direct violence uh, and uh, opportunity for political expression. So when we think about fostering stability and making contributions as a country, as a NATO member, as an EU or UN member, we must think about all of these aspects uh, and uh, perhaps contributing to the military security options is a good start, but it is certainly only one of the domains to address. Uh, so thinking about the great power interests here, um, historically, as Daniel has already talked about uh, the Anglo and Francophone issues, uh, let me very quickly say perhaps the most modern challenges to do with security, how that uh, pertains to the US. Uh, so we saw the, the sort of the great war on terror as we now know it. Uh, Africa is essentially where it started. We saw Osama bin Laden rise to prominence by uh, arranging attacks uh, against American bases in Africa. Those were the first, uh, the first things, uh, the first instances of such type back in the 90s. And so the U.S. started to engage uh, and view Africa primarily through this sort of extended security as in let's deal with this problem before it reaches our borders type of situation. So they started training the troops, sending peacekeeping missions, uh, and lo and behold, we saw not too long ago uh, in Mali that the, U the troops, the people that U.S. troops have trained uh, overthrew the illegally elected government and, started, and that's how the rebellion started. So those intentions of fighting the terrorism before it sort of boys, uh, that's also not a monodynamical no, mono story, uh, right? And there's also the whole issue of, while it's nice to show that all the allies care, NATO cares, the UN cares, and that we're working together uh, on a mission like uh, African security in Chad or, or Somalia or Mali or Nigeria, 
there, there is a, the, the question of ethics uh, of using this as a testing ground for new national or international strategies or as a training ground for international troops to learn command and control tactics. The, that question needs to be addressed. Which side of the debate you fall on is another matter, but it is a question to reckon with. Uh, the other great powers, or well, shall we say perhaps more self-considered great powers, such as, uh, such as China and Russia, have had interests much of a different type in Africa. China over the past 10, 15 years has been particularly active in economic competition, uh, mining uh, resources, uh, oil extraction, uh, heavily, heavily competing with companies previously there, many of which were American. Russians were primarily engaged in arms trade, trying to get on the economic bandwagon, not succeeding so much there, but those, those axes are, so the competition there is primarily in economic terms, and neither China nor Russia, well, other than selling arms, are very much engaged in this peacekeeping, building, making, development situation otherwise. They are much more engaged, especially China, in the development portion of it, that is, investing in infrastructure without asking questions about your political leanings. Uh, finally, immigration is another big thing that touches not only global powers, but EU and basically every country. Uh, as uh, people who have, shall we say, more radical leanings flood to the continent, uh, again, I'm thinking here MENA, so not just Africa, but also, also the Arab countries. From, from the US, you have uh, people from, from Ukraine and Latvia even coming to fight there. Problem number one. Problem number two, when those fighters come back home and then they train other fighters. Uh, we saw those problems uh, start with Afghanistan, warriors, local warriors who fought there spreading in the continent, but now we're seeing those returnees come back to France, Britain, other places, right? So essentially, uh, economics, immigration, and security, very sort of multi-dyadic issues that play out in Africa as much as other places, but since the spotlight is there, happy to answer more questions on that. Thank you, Agla, and uh, uh, I'm sure we'll come back to some of the questions uh, afterwards. And now, uh, David Ashlekis, and uh, what about Lithuania? Why do we care, and uh, why should we care about security situation in Africa, and why we ended up in Africa, actually, with our military group? Thank you. Well, Three also, to four minutes. <laughs> yeah, okay, so it's a question. Last week with my students back in Vilnius University, we have seminars about Ebola in Western Africa. So we were discussing should we do something and what is the role of Lufine and all these events. So I would say students w wasn't very empathical, empathetical. I say it's far away. Maybe we may give some money through humanitarian missions or through European Union funding, etc. But uh, otherwise, let's say maybe st let's stay away. So I will always I was trying to say, but what about human security? About human suffering and not only practical and pragmatical issues like let's say uh, if you solve the problem of challenges of Ebola, other countries like Britain or America will pay more attention to Ukrainian and Baltic state region because otherwise, like in 2014, uh, when Ebola was on a high level, uh, all newspapers and internet sites was about Ebola, not about Ukraine. Especially in August 2014, when you have Ilovaisk, nobody cares about Ilovaisk, everybody cares about Ebola. It's important, but sitting in Lithuania, you are very afraid of Russia, and you would like to see that American newspapers could write a bit more about Russia too, not only Ebola, but you have 1% about Russia and 99% about Ebola. So you'd like to have more balance, and in this sense, I would say, let's help from humanitarian and very pragmatical reasons. And in any case, you will st still help people to ease the pain and suffering and find the solutions. Uh, going, looking now what we're doing in Africa, so humanitarian logic, let's say, to, to ease the pain, to help people to, f to help, to assist. I think the good word is to assist, not, let's say, to build, or, but to help and assist building giving some consultants and experience, uh, but not, let's say, starting building by, them, by ourselves, like we did basically in Afghanistan. That is a wrong lesson. So when looking from Lithuania and especially military politics, so we're learning and we're doing military assistance. And I think it's very good because on one hand, in Lithuania we're learning that military assistance is one of the major military operation type. And we should spend more 
money and train more people to do military assistance because we're doing military assistance in Iraq, in Ukraine, and in Africa, especially Mali. So it's a major component of contemporary military activities. It's not only about the battles, tanks, planes, or finding in the forest or urban terrains. It's military assistance becoming very important uh, type of mission, military mission type. So to get experience in this kind of military operations is very useful for Lithuanian military. And by doing that, you're assisting people in Mali or, let's say, in Central African Republic. Uh, also, by doing that, doing military assistance, you're learning to understand the uh, mentality of local people more better. And you get understanding about this variety of causes why conflict starts. It's not, about the, it's not only geopolitics, which we kind of uh, emphasizing here in Lithuania because, again, ab about the Russian importance. It's not only about geopolitics. Sometimes it's ethnicity, tribes, religion, religion is coming back, uh, migration, climate change. So I would guess people are coming back from Africa with much more wider understanding of this complexity and also that military is a solution but only part of that and you have to you have to change the ways how you do your policy, how do you even train your military officers. Also, you're working together with your allies. So it's a solidarity. If you want a French soldiers in Rukla, in Lithuania, uh, so you have to send somebody to, to help them. It's a burden sharing. Uh, so you, you're finding a balance. Of course, our numbers are not very big, but again, when you're looking in our commitments and our defense policy that we are tying up our soldiers on Lithuanian soil. So these numbers are not so small and we're increasing steadily, but we're increasing and especially into Africa. In the last four years, it's the biggest increase, let's say, in military part participation and I think it's not the, it, we're not stopping here. I think uh, my colleagues maybe know, know better, but I guess numbers will increase in the next couple of years. Sadly, conflicts are not disappearing in Africa. So learning Working and you're working with French and Germans and British officers, soldiers in in Africa. So you're learning, let's say, this tactical level understanding. You're working with your colleagues. You're creating a bonds between Western allies and your allies and partners in Africa. So that again is a good lessons. And uh, I w I'm talking maybe from from military understanding what why it's uh, good to, or necessary to be in Africa, but. Again, conflicts are happening where they are happening. They are happening in Africa. So if you want to be in a business understanding of security policy, why big countries and allies doing something the way they are doing, you have to be in this area too. So if when you're being in Africa, you have a better understanding of the logic of French policy or British policy or maybe even American policy, let's say, from global global regional perspective, and then you may try to find Lithuania in all that map what we can do and can we, let's say, maybe we can shape a little bit to our advantage too. So it's, uh, and you're showing a flag, let's say, to get uh, bonuses, especially from Mr. Donald Trump or something like that, let's say that we're doing something, not staying back in Lithuania only. So that's it. Okay, thank you. <laughs> and now we go to Neringa and she's an expert in UN. And, uh, I'd like to ask something about UN position in, in uh, peacekeeping operations and maybe a bit more about mandate, how actually countries or uh, UN, you know, releases a mandate and when um, UN Security Council decides that it's necessary to go and do something, uh, how the procedure actually looks like. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, first of all, for inviting me here, and I was an expert in UN during the uh, Lithuanian uh, membership uh, in the Security Council, and uh, I was dealing with the civilian uh, protection of civilians in, in, in conflict, so it's a bit related with the peacekeeping operations. Um, first of all, I think uh, we should understand that uh, peacekeeping operations uh, is not an enforcement tool. Uh, however, the, the uh, use force at the tactical level and only when it's authorized by the Security Council. So, in general, uh, I think peacekeeping uh, missions is, uh, they are not uh, dealing only with the maintaining peace and security. They are dealing with the, a lot of other issues uh, in, in, uh, in the places they are uh, mandated. Also, they are facilitating political processes. They are protect, protect, protecting civilians. They are assisting in disarmament, uh, demobilization, and reintegration of former combatants. 
they are supporting and organizing elections, they are promoting human rights and assisting restoring rule of law. And I think all these components are very important because sometimes we really understand that peacekeeping missions are only coming and, I don't know, protecting, securing, and, and that's all. But they are doing a lot of uh, other work uh, which is not related with the using of force at all. So, uh, uh, at the moment, uh, UN having, uh, has um, 14 peacekeeping operations and half of it, seven, is in Africa. So, I think that is uh, being in Africa and being interesting what peacekeeping is doing in Africa is very important because half of the UN work in peacekeeping is in Africa. So, um, as I told, uh, that protection of civilians' mandate is very important. And um, actually, 95% uh, of peacekeepers are mandated to protect civilians at the moment. Uh, so, um, in many cases, peacekeeping mission are authorized to use all necessary means to protect civilians from physical threat. And we are uh, talking uh, then about so-called robust peacekeeping, which means that uh, forces are allowed to use force. And uh, we have two robust peacekeeping missions, and both of them are in Africa. It's in Mali, and the other were in uh, Democratic Republic of Congo. So uh, when we're talking about peacekeeping, I think we should understand that peacekeeping is guided by three main principles, that uh, there, are, there should be uh, consent of the parties to, to have peacekeeping operation on the ground, then that peacekeepers should be impartial, and uh, the third one, it's uh, non-use of force, uh, except in self-defense and in defense of the mandate. So that's only two, uh, if, if we're talking not about robust peacekeeping. So uh, how uh, actually um, peacekeeping coming on the ground? So shortly that only Security Council is mandated to uh, to authorize every peacekeeping mission under the Chapter 7 of United Nations Charter, and it's the only uh, way to have peacekeeping, uh, UN peacekeeping on the ground. Sometimes uh, when there is no uh, UN peacekeeping and there is a decision that uh, some, some peacekeeping forces should be on the ground, uh, UN can ask, for example, NATO or African Union uh, to, to present their peacekeepers there. For example, in Central African Republic, before the uh, UN peacekeeping operation was settled, there was the peacekeeping mission from African Union, and uh, there were national forces from, from France. Uh, so, uh, there should be an agreement uh, between uh, between host country and uh, uh, and uh, United Nations uh, about exact size of operation and how it will operate. So, so basically, I think uh, shortly uh, this is it, and I will be glad to answer uh, any questions if. Okay, great. thank you very much. And now we'll move to uh, Carlos Alexa, and uh, he knows everything about how we ended up actually in, in Africa and uh, why uh, in Mali, for example, or in Central African Republic, and uh, for how long, maybe, and, you know, thank you. Uh, first of all, I, I think that uh, it is very good that we, had, we have such a discussion on, on, uh, on let's say, Lithuanians, Lithuanian link towards Africa, because we once, I think, uh, very usefully discussed our link towards Afghanistan when we began this mission. And I think this is very important to have also this kind of discussion. And I believe that uh, we have, let's say, both sides. On one side, it is simplicity, as, my, as I may call it. And on the other side, is complexity, which was presented here uh, in, a, in a very good way. Complexity meaning, let's say, the challenges that, that there are in Africa in different way and how, let's say, uh, different African nations perceive uh, themselves and also those who are trying to help them. I think this is crucial because uh, as, as being in the Ministry of Defense or let's say in a security institution, we always uh, tend to think in a very simplistic way. And uh, let's say this is the complex picture with, with the challenges 
it is, let's say, one side, and already looking at the efforts that already are invested in Africa, just, let's say, having in mind that MINUSMA UN mission, uh, which is about 15,000 of troops, civilians, and also, let's say, one billion of budget for this mission, it is, uh, you might think, about the numbers just alone, uh, having in mind that Lithuanian defense budget is approaching one billion, and which is already an achievement. So it is just one mission. Uh, and, and still, let's say, uh, we, we see the discussions in United Nations that there are challenges of capability, of producing capability. Uh, so we might think that there was mentioned uh, not, not once today seven missions, but in those seven missions, 90,000 of troops and civilians who are involved, let's say, who are deployed in Africa, in different African nations, uh, states. Uh, so, a uh, huge number, and uh, let's say this is, I think, the approach that already it is, let's say, pushed and, and, and let's say, um, accepted as well. It is this integrated approach of United Nations missions, which means that you have to look from all angles, civilian, military, regional, uh, regional actors, uh, and also, let's say, trying to look how to build trust between uh, those serving in the mission and also between local population, because that's what it's all about. If you look at the conflict resolution, conflict solution, so you might use uh, every possible instrument. You can uh, put uh, much resources, but it can be just wasted. And uh, just uh, to, to continue, let's say, on, on this number, mm -hmm. so let's say looking at the European, European Union uh, financial input, so looking at the financial perspective of 2013-20, so about 8 billion of euros which are towards, let's say, uh, support for, for, the, for the Africa in, in, in let's say, rebuilding. Uh, so we have, let's say, complex, complexity with the challenges and already much, much of the effort. And in this whole picture, you might think what is Lithuania is here and how it can make a difference. So turning in this simplicity aside, so there are very simple arguments uh, which was already by David a little bit, so let's say, presented, uh, but which were very crucial when we began, let's say, missions uh, 23 years ago. This is interoperability and modernization, meaning that you, uh, you uh, start to participate in, mis in missions and that gives you interoper interoperability with partners, how to act together, and also push, pushes you towards modernization. You see what is needed for your soldiers and how to improve. Uh, but of course, this is just two, I think, of, of the arguments. Uh, another argument, and, and I think uh, very important and solid arguments for, well, for, for the Lithuanian participation is, of course, solidarity. Solidarity for solving those issues because we look not only at the East, we look at the South, and Africa is well, it was well, very well presented of, of MENA, let's say, region, but Africa is, is very much here, and we have to look in, into this. Uh, of course, another thing is, is solidarity and, and burden sharing, uh, meaning that we have here our allies, which was in uh, Afghanistan's case, and, and uh, let's say this is the same case. Germany, France is in Africa, for example, Canadians, they are also very much engaged and, and uh, Canada is also a very important partner for us, uh, meaning, let's say, support for our energy security center of excellence, our joint efforts in Ukraine. Uh, so this is uh, very crucial to have, let's say, uh, them on board. And I think uh, solidarity in the sense that uh, being together with our allies and partners in Africa, we are defending Lithuania as well. So this is, I think, very, very clear expression. So. Okay, thank you so much. And now, uh, Gintas Gumbris, and he knows everything uh, about practical issues of mission, how it actually works for a soldier to be in a mission in, in, in a different one. And I know that he came back from Mali just, I don't know, a few weeks ago. Uh, and he said that it's super hot there and it's pretty difficult to work there. So how, how it's, you know, to, and you're a soldier, you end up in a mission how it works there. Good day every, everyone. Uh, first of all, I would like to stress that this is my personal opinion. So, <laughs> okay. Uh, okay. I would like to start with uh, 
short personal thought, touch on this issue. What does it mean to be a soldier? For me to be a soldier, to be a, an officer, it means that you must be ready or you must be able to protect and defend yourself. If you are able to defend yourself, it means that you will be able to defend your family. And, you, and if you will be able to defend your family, you will be able to defend your country. So before any deployment, uh, every soldier must pass long-lasting trainings. He must be physically and mentally fit. So uh, you must be uh, well-skilled, well-trained, well-equipped, and well-motivated. So uh, if you are deployed, it means that already you achieved uh, maybe your goal, the main goal. Uh, it means that uh, all your efforts that you put it in your past, uh, that you showed, uh, that you, um, uh, the time you spent during your tra trainings was very important. Uh, from other side, uh, it is unique uh, ability to, to get a very important experience. So uh, you can learn from your colleagues, you can learn from uh, even from your uh, not friendly forces, uh, some tactics, some techniques, how to fight, some guerrilla tactics, etc. And it can be extremely important in order to enhance your national defense capabilities. So uh, that's why I think that uh, for every soldier uh, participation in any international operation should be, uh, should be the main goal in his career. Uh, here you can see some pictures uh, from our uh, international missions and operations especially in Africa, and the main challenges, as it was mentioned before, is uh, weather conditions, uh, environment, uh, and I think this uh, multinational environment and different people, different culture, um, different uh, attitude to, to us, to, to our soldiers. Um, what's more? Should I say something more? Or? <laughs> okay. So uh, I will tell you a little bit uh, uh, about all international operations that our soldiers are deployed. So, so we have two naval uh, operations, Sofia and Atalanta. So you can see that our soldiers get experience in very quite different and interesting and uh, exciting uh, international operations. So our naval forces are trained and they are participating in these missions. Our land forces participating in international operations and missions as well. Uh, these mis missions and international operations are quite different. We uh, have force protection unit in Mali, also we have uh, four soldiers uh, that are responsible for uh, training missions, European training missions in Mali and in Repo Central Republic of Africa. Uh, and uh, the main contingent, and it was mentioned uh, by our minister, uh, wise minister of defense, is in MINUSMA. So uh, I think that. Uh, we, uh, at the moment, we have five international operations there, and it's really important for us, for soldiers, to, to get this experience and to be there and uh, to become better tomorrow than you are today. Uh, okay, thank you very much, and uh, very much. And I'd like to pick up from the last thing you actually said about usefulness of being there. And uh, we heard about this from a couple of, of, of uh, panelists. We do talk a lot about uh, usefulness of being there, about uh, cooperation with partners, about, uh, uh, about training and, and et cetera. But uh, what about locals? 
what do they think about, you know, pouring troops on the ground in their country? And uh, I'm sure some of them are happy, I'm sure, but maybe some of them are not. And we actually rarely talk about that, about, uh, you know, African societies who actually live, uh, for example, if, you t if we take Mali, uh, we do have a really difficult situation in Mali, and at some point, uh, the power is shifting from, from Bamako, from a central government, to actually uh, peacekeeping operation center. And it's uh, kind of this balance already there. I mean, some, some experts do say that they can feel this disbalance. So, um, you know, question for everybody, uh, please. And uh, yeah, thank you. Uh, maybe a couple of remarks. One, one is from my broader research. The point is that when you do military operation, when you have a war, you always have to keep in mind that it changes not only military dimension, political, social, economical, cultural will change. So basically when you have foreign soldiers with good intentions, and, and you said, let's say, so we have a spillover, uh, we changing political geography of Mali. Political center is moving. That is collateral effect. And you have, and it, it happens, but uh, you cannot predict everything. So basically, uh, you all, so you're coming with good intentions. So you always, uh, from my readings about uh, Western countries fighting or helping in other countries, like in Afghanistan or Iraq, uh, you have to train your soldiers, but that is difficult in anthropology or ethnography to read the locals, to understand, to so understand dynamics, not to manipulate dynamics in local, level, but to understand, let's say, how the village is living, let's say, who is a gatekeeper, who is a boss, who is a strong man, let's say, if you wanted to do something, so you have to find the concrete person, how they operate, let's say, what is important to them, maybe justice, or maybe social welfare, because in different cultures, different regions is different, so matrix is changing, so let's say, you cannot apply African lessons, to, sorry, Afghanistan lessons to, uh, to Africa, even if you have good anthropological studies. Uh, so in a sense, but the basic line is, you have to come in and you must, well, British imperialists, they did a lot of bad job in Africa, but one thing, let's say what military was doing, the major generals and officers were anthropologists, and they were trained to be anthropologists when they were operating in Africa, because you have to understand the local dynamics, otherwise you will lose. So in this sense, when you're coming to Africa, you have to understand what is joy for locals, what is pain for locals, and then f try to find connection. Because, yes, you are from outside, and you always will be a little bit paternalistic. Sadly enough, and maybe in Lithuania, you better, we don't have a strong traditions in African studies, so basically we're operating with a lot of stereotypes. Soldiers are coming from society which is operating according to some stereotypes. And it's sometimes damages probably efficiency or effectiveness of operation unless you get a good training education. But again, when you're teaching in a military academy, how much time you can spend this to African studies or Latin American studies. So it's a, we're doing a good job now. So we, our cadets are now getting a lot of African studies. Uh, so it's, it's, it's good. Finally, we're doing that, but uh, we're doing that in 2018. So that is question mark where we were five, ten years ago. Just to, just to follow up on uh, what he has said, um, <clears throat> I think um, it's a critical point to understand uh, the local dynamics and it begins with um, um, doing courses on African studies, taking it seriously, investing in African studies uh, to match military troops in the region as well so that more understanding is had about uh, the geography so people can place countries on the map and know where they belong to in different parts. Uh, I think that's, that's important, but also because uh, warfare is changing. Uh, and a lot of the warfare that will take place will take place in cities, in belt up areas, where the distinction between uh, combatants and civilians is often blurred. And when you have that context, and you, these soldiers are going to be operating in a context of international humanitarian law, where the basic fundamental principle is that you must distinguish between a civilian and a combatant. And you're thrown into, you know, Kidal region in Mali, or you're thrown into northeastern Nigeria, where everybody looks the same, put on a turban. The terrorist groups themselves operate from within the community. They attack and they disappear into the community in the haze of dust created. 
how do you navigate that territory? It becomes very dangerous when you come in with a stereotype of who the terrorist is. So you begin, there's a tendency then, which has happened in many cases, to see the locals as the terrorists and to draw a moral equivalence between a local population and a Boko Haram, a local population and an Al-Shabaab region. And especially when soldiers get hurt in attacks, then they feel that, you know, we are going to revert to the old stereotype, the young African male, we're going to get them and we're going to arrest them or torture them. So this is important then to draw that distinction. And part of that distinction, I argue, is a problem of knowledge. This is not a war that can be won with drones in the sky. This is a war that has to be won with eyes on the street. It's a civil military relations. And that's why the US is beginning to go towards the winning the hearts and minds of the, of the people, the local population. This is about involving the local people and seeing them as agents of their own change. And so vigilante groups, whether in Mali or in, 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 in uh, part of the training and developing capacities, working with local vigilante groups, people who understand the local context, understand the local dynamics, uh, and, 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 uh, and doing away with any hubris by soldiers to feel that we are superior to any other local form of uh, policing that has endured for many, many decades. So that's important, the principle of distinctions. And many soldiers that I talk to, whether it's in Mali or in northeastern Nigeria or in Somalia, they talk about the problem that we just cannot see the terrorists. We cannot draw that distinction, and that becomes a problem, and then you need uh, locals to be able to understand that context. If I might just build on what you're saying, uh, and this is, not, this is a problem not solely confined to Africa. As we're seeing more and more types of crises that in my line of work we call gray zone conflict, right? So it's not even necessarily an open war where people fight with machetes or shotguns, but it's really not your peace situation. People don't feel safe. People feel different types of intimidation or pressure. Uh, it might be, you know, economic pressures on state levels such as sanctions, but it might be, uh, you know, gang warfare trying to intimidate new businessmen, uh, women's groups being intimidated uh, from seeking opportunities outside child rearing, essentially. So just a couple of, uh, a few points that I wanted to raise here. As you have already rightly noted, it is very difficult to distinguish civilians from combatants when masking as a civilian is increasingly the norm in combat. And again, this is not just in Africa. This is, uh, this is uh, what we're seeing in Ukraine just as much, right? Point number one. Point number two, you're stepping into a power dynamic which was there before you, but which is dynamic. That's the word, right? So you're part of shaping it. And if you are working with a local vigilante group today, five years from now, that might into a government overthrower group. And that's what we saw happen in Afghanistan, that's what we saw happen in Mali. So there's no, nobody has the sort of monopoly of truth or justice. And you might very well be coming in with good intentions towards your allies to support the French, the Americans, towards the locals to support their living. But it is a changing power dynamic, so you're picking sides locally. So you better be aware which sides you're picking, point number two. Uh, point number three, uh, we're talking in this in rather abstract terms, and I'm really looking forward on the military side of this panel to get into some sort of the realities, the nitty gritty of the operation, what a day looks like. Because let's face it, when we're talking protecting civilians, uh, that means protecting them from somebody, probably from somebody violent. Again, how do you make a value judgment? Who of the two conflicting parties needs protection? Uh, collecting guns in disar I mean disarmament. This is not that people just came out there with their machetes, you know, as an offering to you. You usually have to take them forcibly, and it's difficult. So it's it is pretty violent, difficult, challenging scenarios, uh, technically uh, on, on the operational ground as well as psychologically. Um, how are we dealing with the troops who come back? Are we helping them to deal with the trauma, survive there? Uh, that's kind of the dark side of the matter, but on the completely positive side of the matter, are we integrating those lessons? We're rotating two troops, you know, through Africa, two troops through Middle East every year. Where do those lessons learn go institutionally? And finally, just uh, really quickly about the allies and the relevant case points. I mean, 
it, it was almost a national narrative of pride, how Lithuania was so proud of Aitvar as being the horror of the locals in Afghanistan. Like, we're riding on our motorcycles and, you know, the black bandanas, and, and we're so proud of how everybody's afraid of us. But this is not how you win the hearts and minds. Nobody, I mean, the Americans, the French, they don't really want you to come out there and, you know, be the horror of Mali now. So I'm sure that this is not an institutional objective, but as, uh, as various types of forces, special forces, air forces, naval forces, people with different taskings get sent there on a mandate, how are we, how are we, well, perhaps prevent another Afghanistan reputation-wise would be too much of a statement, but how are we managing our image there? Uh, and, uh, and the allies, you know, saying that we're there to support the allies, saying that, that we are there for the French and Germans, that's all the, also not a mono, like, monolithic picture. The Germans have become very, very skeptical of peacekeeping, particularly in Africa, since the disaster in Libya. Gaddafi was overthrown, but the country isn't any better for it. And France was very proud of it, went into Mali following Libya, as in building, going from success to success, not so much at the moment. So really, you know, where, where is the discussion in the Lithuanian policy community with the Lithuanian society about the broader outcomes that we're trying to support in Africa, not just kind of use it as a training ground to show to our allies how nice we are? Please, military side of the panel. <laughs> wow. I, uh, yeah, I can see that we can talk for, I don't know, maybe for a week about this. <laughs> Let's go. <laughs> so, some, some information is classified, so, so we, can, we cannot be so open as, as we could, but... Um, okay, about lessons learned, first of all. So, so, yes, we have a system of lessons learned and all member, or all soldier, every soldier who participated in the international operation, he must fulfill special report forms and etc. and we are dealing with his system. All this lessons learned system is connected with NATO lessons learned system or other, our partners lessons learned systems and we get some information as well as some support in case of emergency or in case if we need some support how to uh, uh, mm, let's say f uh, overcome this post tra trauma uh, and etc for example uh, can I Canada uh, they have a perfect system how to integrate soldiers after the uh, some assault uh, if these soldiers were assaulted by soldiers kids uh, so kids that are soldiers, child, yes. So, so uh, there are plenty of examples of this lessons learned and lessons identified uh, systems, and I think it works uh, quite properly. Uh, we as a soldiers are, let's say, uh, trying to accomplish our mission. We do not decide where we should go and what we should do. Uh, it's not our business and we are trying to do our best in order to, to accomplish all these tasks uh, that are uh, written in, uh, um, let's say, mandate or, or official statement of the mission. So, uh, yes, there are some challenges, especially in Africa. Yes, we know, we know that the distance between one border of Mali to the other is larger than the distance from Berlin to Rome. So if you want to operate with, let's say, 1,000 or 10,000 uh, soldiers, it's challenging, very challenging. It's, uh, there are plenty of challenges in logistic or, or medical evacuation capabilities, but I think that very important thing in this uh, is that our soldiers are not there to kill or to shoot anybody. They are uh, providing uh, a stability, or at least they are trying to provide a stability for this country. And these people who are in that country, in Mali or in RCA, they see us not as an enemy. And uh, when I was in Mali, they do not look at us like, oh, someone bad guy, etc. 
they are looking at us with a hope that, okay, maybe one day uh, we will have a peace and there will not be any war or, or conflict. So uh, maybe it's, there are no uh, very fast decisions and tools. How can we achieve this? Uh, and it was mentioned two aspects, military aspects. And the military aspect is that, first of all, we must uh, ensure the safety and stability. And we have, and if we have safety and stability in the area, then we have, we can have some uh, possibility to, to, to implement these development projects and etc. So, so I think that working together, uh, hand by hand, military and civilians is one of the possible ways where we can uh, see uh, some possible uh, changes in these regions. I think that, uh, as we have talked, the reality is not so simple. For example, looking into Afghanistan, as it was the situation we had, we had not only, let's say, Al-Qaeda, but also those different warlords who were fighting against each other, and uh, you have to choose coalitions in order to achieve, let's say, goal, temporary maybe goal, and then to, to look for this reconcilia reconciliation in the longer term. So I think that, you know, uh, then in this sense, uh, there, should, there can be, you know, easy solutions. And let's say soldiers or a few soldiers who, who are sent, they can look at this more or less basically tactical level, especially, for example, as we have now force protection unit in, 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 in Mali. So they are looking at these tactical, let's say, tasks and how to improve and how to be interoperable, let's say, with Germans. Uh, but of course, looking at the broader pers perspective, uh, you might ask a more general question because in UN missions, Europeans' input is not so big. And you might ask if those who are, let's say, investing, uh, let's say, those African states themselves, and they are putting thousands of soldiers, how they are, let's say, communicating this, let's say, this conflict turned societies and states. And uh, if, let's say, how they are behaving in, in a good manner or, or not in a good manner. And uh, in, this context, in this context, you might ask if Europeans should do more, if they are better in a way that they have, let's say, a more better approach, which could also could be discussed. So I think it is a discussion. I'm not an expert. I, I think that would be a very interesting discussion in the sense. But I think that Europeans are investing, uh, is, 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 is beginning to invest more, because if you look at these United Nations missions, let's say in, in MINUSMA and MINUSCA, if you talk about Central African Republic, so you might see that there are complementing European Union training missions, which are, let's say, uh, reinforcing UN missions which are especially uh, uh, directed towards this assisting, as David has mentioned. Because it's, it is very important to change, uh, let's say, the model how armed forces or state security system works. And it is a very old model. Let's say uh, Germans tried, uh, proposed before the First World War to Osmans, to Turks, to reform their army. And they, let's say, Turks and, and Germans went to negotiations uh, to, to put German general as a general supervisor of reforming the whole Osman Turk, let's say, Empire Armed Forces. So uh, this is not new concept, and, and this is a very powerful concept, but uh, I think uh, it is not only one side. That's the case, and, and that's the case everywhere when we are trying to assist, because there should be reciprocity. Those, that recipient side should, let's say, accept and should show willing political will and, let's say, to have administrative capabilities, resources, how to manage all those. Because you might go after some time and, let's say, the problem will, will, will let's say, will stay. So just, just to, to show that, let's say, we understand, but it's, it's, it's very complex. Our numbers are not so big. But, of course, at the tactical level uh, and at some point at operational level, we look how to, to be more efficient. And now, as, as our vice minister said, we, we are, let's say, sending to this NATO center, new, newly created of SAU Hub, uh, the expert on Sahel. So he will be, let's say, uh, devoted to the task of uh, having interconnection with uh, uh, NGOs in, in the region and in all those different kind of uh, civil organizations. So I think that uh, we just are augmenting, let's say, our understanding. So I think that the motto should be 
for us to, to learn and to understand more Africa has to be more efficient because we are learning now, I think we are learning at the tactical, operational, and I think at, at the strategic level of understanding. So this is, I think, just just uh, a beginning of, of our journey. And I believe that we, we should, let's say, continue our discussions and uh, as well have mm, this as a very fruitful input in our, let's say, future involvement. Um, okay. Because it was touched upon the protection of civilians and how to distinguish, make a distinction between the uh, who is attacking them and who is a civilian. And I think for United Nations, uh, therefore, uh, the training of troops uh, is very important because only uh, competent and trained troops are really uh, ready to make this di distinction. And uh, the other uh, important uh, thing is uh, cooperation between the uh, mission components, the civilian and the military component, because, for example, uh, child protection advisors or protection of civilian uh, uh, advisors or uh, advisors on the sexual related violence, they are uh, making contact with local population, they are making contact with religious leaders, which is helping them to understand who is civilian, who is attacking them, and who is the threat for them. And then when they are having, uh, I don't know, cooperation in, in mission, uh, then for military troops, I hope it's easier to make their job. I'm, I'm, I don't know how it works on the ground, but I think that, uh, that for UN, it's very important, this cooperation uh, between the mission components. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, it was mentioned European powers and uh, um, I'd like, I'd like to ask, uh, there are a lot of French in, in Africa and lots of French interests in Africa and as well uh, some Germans and some British and uh, all of them, they were colonial powers before and they do have their own interests there. And uh, how we blend into this and what about our interests? Do we follow our partners in NATO or in EU or do we, I don't know, what do we do actually with these interests? Because I think it's important to address that they do have their own national interest on a side to a peacekeeping or other operations what they're doing there. Thank you. But we also have our national interest. We want our French soldiers on the Lithuanian, Belarusian or Russian border. So like France has in Niger, I think, uh, uranium mines, let's say, and it's not far away from the Mali border. So basically you have French military units on Nigeria, Chad and Mali be defending strategic business interests because this uranium goes to French nuclear facilities, civilian electricity. I was reading just newest article published in a quite in, in, in important journal, 71% of French electricity is made from uranium who is taking, bring, brought back from Africa. So basically it's a key strategic asset. So yes, of course you do that, but, uh, but not going here only because of uranium, you do, uh, Mali, we will, not, we will not talk a lot about that, but uh, in Mali, why we have this crisis, it was jihadists and Al-Qaeda, but also drug cartels. The cartels from Latin America into Western Africa, and then they're going to all these drugs, and especially cocaine, to Europe. And maybe in Lithuania, we're not feeling that uh, drug problem, but in France or Netherlands or United Kingdom, it's a very, very big thing. And basically, northern Mali is a hub of drug dealers, and they facilitated, let's say, this dramatic change in Mali and in local countries too uh, around. So basically, and so, so you're fighting drug dealers, so it's a French and British national interest. But uh, in that way, why, okay, let's support that. I think it's a very good cause. And as I said, we are very also very pragmatic. And if you send soldiers, in 2014, I think we sent an airplane to Central African Republic, yes, when we have, in, it's a, I think a couple of weeks or three weeks a mission was. But the point was, you helping French. Then later on, you may ask uh, some privileges or dividends. Let's say we send some soldiers and we help politically uh, something to do in Africa. Now maybe let's bring more soldiers or give some political leverage 
concerning Ukraine or NATO policy towards Eastern flank, etc. So it's a it's a rational, pragmatic game. But I always would like to emphasize that maybe we're not as so very cynical and doing everything from pragmatical point of view. There's always humanitarian intentions. But uh, but yeah, so why not? They have they, we have ours. So everybody knows this interest. So let's play a game. Yeah, I, I think I think. Um I think it's problematic um, when we uh, engage from a, 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 a point of view of, of Africa being a space where contending interests and games are played. I think we need to rethink um, these concepts, uh, especially um, as, as more and more soldiers begin to go to the region. Africa is not a place where games uh, are played and where you have strikers and defenders. You, uh, Africa uh, is an agent of itself. Nor is Africa a place where um, um, helping uh, real life situations, people's lived life situations, uh, where uh, over two million people are displaced, where women are sexually abused in displaced uh, people's camps. Uh, I think we need to go beyond just aligning with you know, particular French or, or British interests. I think there's a call uh, for for uh, a response from a much more deeper and sustainable place. Otherwise, we would reproduce what happened in Libya, where no sooner had we felt that job is done than we left, and, and we live in crisis. Or we can come from a situation where uh, we pick and select which battles we want to fight. And so today, with my students who were doing the Rwandan genocide in 1994, Rwandan genocide was going on even as USA 94 soccer game was going on. And in 100 days, over 1 million people were killed. And there was very slow response to that. So very, it's important to, to ground strategic interest in real life situations uh, and to realize that people's lives have been, uh, are being affected here and to put a human face uh, to that. And why is this important? It's important because uh, as Lithuanians, uh, soldiers begin to go into the region that they can rethink their position as agents, even as they have an interest in aligning with your partners. Lithuania is a subject to itself and can rethink what is our goal? What do we want to do here? Are we just aligning ourselves? Is that a sufficient uh, uh, engagement with, with is, it does, is that sufficiently reflective of the kind of policy we want to have? But we want something much more robust that includes some of the things you talked about, the development aspect, investing uh, in, 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 in the training and employment of uh, youth, and finding gainful work and all the likes. So I think it's a, it's a point of reflection uh, for, for what path uh, we, we want to take. But if history is any kind of lesson, um, we know that can, sometimes I feel we do not even know what success looks like when we go to mission. I get surprised when they show me, uh, when the U in the US, uh, whether it's in CNN or in Fox News, they say ISIS has been defeated and I see the rubbles of Raqqa and Mosul. I see civilians, uh, malnourished children and people, you know, with dust on their faces and they say that's success. What is success? And how do we even recognize it? And sometimes I feel people don't even know what that is before going into a mission. And I think that's the first thing we have to understand. Because if Libya's case is success, then that begs a lot of questions you know, about, about what that is. And can we say now, after decades of uh, European missions in Africa, that we have been successful? Or has military presence there slowly morphed into a sort of occupation force, where missions continue to change under the various names, under various operations? but remain on the ground. So these are very hard questions that civilians and soldiers uh, would have to engage with uh, beyond the rules of engagement and the rules of operation because a soldier standing right there and having to make a distinction between whether this is a civilian or combatant, I wonder what rule they will be operating from standing right there and you have a split second to engage or not to engage. Uh, and so these, 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 um, these are some of the issues that I want to, um, to emphasize, and I'll just maybe pass the mic if somebody has any questions. 
If, if I could just two really brief things. Um, since we keep coming back to this issue of distinguishing civilians and combatants, the problem that we're trying to raise on the academic side of the panel is that today's combatant it could be somebody writing uh, posts on Facebook, inciting their community to pick up arms. It could be somebody distributing leaflets, provoking people to do something or to not do something. For example, to not cooperate with the UN soldiers. It could be somebody plotting a political overturn of the country or establishing a new party, like long-term, real long-term strategies. Like, uh, it could be a drone operator sitting far away. It could be somebody using a child as a soldier. It could be somebody using a hostage uh, as a, you know, to carry explosives. The, really, the, the combat terrain, horizontally and vertically, is changing so much that we really have to rethink this. And the other thing just really about Lithuania's sort of objectified view to, to security, I find it so ironic that we still have a lot of this trauma of how Lithuania was always just viewed as a pawn in the game during the Cold War between US and Russia. And you know, we're, we feel so sorry how uh, you know, Washington wouldn't trade the security of Vilnius or rather would rather easily trade the security of Vilnius to not have Washington bombed. And yet we view Africa as the exact same thing where it is acceptable to make bargains for some sort of bigger strategic purpose rather than for, for seeing it for what it is in a particular situation. What Daniel mentioned, so we're, one point is very important. We perceive well, operation is military term, but we perceive our activities in Africa, especially, very military in very militarized manner. So basically, when you said success, I would say even they are using word victory. What is victory today? Especially military victory. Let's define it. It's a academical question, but it's a very important question. Success may be partially something like that, but basically, I was bat battle-centric mentality. How? A lot of people in Western countries understand and see what war is or military operation is. It's basically it's about a war or a battle. We have a battle, we have engagement, it's over, so let's pack and go home. Let's see how lives is happening after this battle, after capturing Mosul. Nobody cares because it seems that it automatically will be coming to life. Electricity will be happening, water will be flowing, people going to the markets and shops and children to the schools. Nobody cares or thinks about, let's say, how somebody has to rebuild it. And it is a part of war too, actually. But you have, to, but we talking too much, I would say, from militarized or this battle-centric approach, understanding of the conflict. Conflicts are not only battles. And that is a broader education of society, let's say, how, because when you hear the news that, let's say, we are in a mission, so basically, okay, so what our soldiers did? They helped to defend some base or capture some enemies. Okay, job well done, you have a medal, welcome home. But it's only part of war, it's only part of conflict, and we're not talking about the other sides of the conflicts, we're not educating people or explaining, they say that the war and conflicts are very complex. And that, but that is coming from our Western military history and training and uh, et cetera, et cetera. So we have to stop thinking about war as a battle. It's a very, it's not, it's a, it's a way we're go going nowhere if you have this mentality. So maybe just uh, reacting, but uh, on, on this, uh, Germany, France, and why we are, let's say, going together, as it was raised in, in, in that manner. I think that, uh, as I said, we understand the challenges in the South. I think that's, that's the first point. And uh, we are stating that clearly in our, let's say, security strategies. And uh, also, we are members of the European Union. And European Union looks uh, very carefully, let's say, at the South and uh, how it might affect the life of European Union citizens. So I think it's... Uh, and we should understand that it might affect uh, those living in Lithuania and, both, and those Lithuanians who are living in other European Union countries. So this is, I think, uh, very natural that we are looking uh, also at the side and we are willing to participate and to contribute. And I think that, uh, well, of course, that, that plays into, into the hand that we are participating together, say, with uh, Germans, uh, with French, uh, because uh, uh, they know, let's say, the region, and we might be more efficient 
together with them, but the participation of them with somebody else, maybe with African or maybe an Asian country, which, which we will spend much of the time trying to understand each other in this military unit, for example, or maybe in this military civil. So it will be much more, let's say, problematics. And we are used, and we are here, let's say, in Lithuania as a, let's say, veteran, in a, in a veteran sense. So I think that we should not look at this in this uh, maybe some kind of cynical, as you have tried a little bit to provocate, I think that we are, uh, this is a strategic approach, because uh, we are, we, we would like uh, to have our input, uh, let's say, uh, and have effect in Africa, and we see that effect coming, let's say, to Germans, to, to French, and maybe from some Nordic countries as well. And uh, we also uh, are, let's say, happy very much when they are here, in, in contributing to the veterans of Lithuania. So I think that we should look at this in a strategic, in a strategic way, and not, not uh, as this way cynical and trying to portray in this colonial, post-colonial. Because if you, if you look in, in this way, so we can, let's say, make uh, claims or, let's say, this kind of accusations to many of the operations. And it wasn't an accusation, it was just, of, you know. this hided interest, because you might look why Chinese uh, are so, let's say, increasing their, uh, let's say, uh, contribution to UN operation. Why are doing so? Why are creating, let's say, bases uh, in, in Africa? So there could be many questions. Thank you. Okay, w one more point on this. Uh, as I understood, we are kind of learning from, for example, French or, or, or Germans, but do they actually learn something from us? Or do they actually value that we are there? Uh, helping them. I mean, because I heard some uh, ideas that they actually asking for for more of our peacekeepers there because we are good apparently. Yes. Uh, first of all, it's really important that our contribution is uh, really uh, get a lot of support from German contingent or, or France. So, so our soldiers are well equipped, and some of our of other countries look at our equipment and say, oh, come on, you have these uh, night vision uh, elements, equipment. Wow, it's uh, the highest standard of this equipment. So we are good, we are well equipped, and uh, maybe the question is, uh, what can they learn from us? So, so during our visit in Mali, uh, we met two force commanders, UTM Ali and, and uh, Minusma, and both uh, told me that, oh, thank you, your, your soldiers are really good. They are really skillful, professional, and they really motivated. So when you see that our soldiers uh, comparing with others, uh, let's say, at least at the same standards or at the same uh, level or maybe a little bit higher is really important for us. It's really important for our country, I think, and, and uh, we can be proud of these soldiers as well. Uh, tactics, techniques, equipment, uh, yes, it's okay, but I think that and the moral factor is very important. So, so our soldiers, as I mentioned, are really, really motivated. And uh, I think maybe it's one of the most important factors on when you are deployed, your motivation and your behavior. Because if you are motivated, you will try to do your best. So, so uh, other countries can see that, okay, Lithuanians, they are really good. They are strong, they are capable, they are professional. And I think it's quite a good message to our partners as well. And they're asking for more. Uh, I was right, yeah? <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, we should start that there. Uh, at the moment, there are 14 United Nations missions. Uh, we have six military uh, European Union uh, uh, international operations. Uh, so, it's quite natural that we get some requests to increase our numbers of troops. So, um, 
I think that ans I answered your question, yeah. Okay, thank you. Uh, if I may, I will point, make two points, and they are related to Lithuanian Soviet legacy. One good point from Soviet legacy in our military culture is that we, as a, our soldiers and all generation of officers were serving in the Soviet military, they were multinational military because Soviet Union military was built from different ethnicities. And this culture, in very intangible ways, in culture and mentality, is this Soviet legacy is in military, but this, I would say, that is a one good point of legacy, that we are kind of inherited to work with other nationalities and work in the multinational military operations, not only because of Afghanistan and Iraq, but it comes even from Soviet times. And another point is more academical, uh, there is more and more now research about our Baltic states, Ukraine and Belarus, in socialist time, that we are not supposed to perceive as a post-communist state, but as a post-colonial state. So basically, we are now research, Lithuanians are researched by Lithuanians as a, let's say we are living in a post-colonial Lithuania, because we was kind of colony of Russia. And I guess there is some, one scholar, uh, for, to, to my knowledge, is comparing with our mentality as a kind of formal colony and how it affects our understandings and being in, let's say, foreign missions like in Afghanistan or like in Africa. So maybe we have better connections with local people because they say also are former colonies. So it's a very, it's a mentality, this perception is difficult to measure, difficult to capture, but I think there's something which in that always legacies from Soviet times, it's a kind of comes to in a positive light and it helps to be better, more efficient, even if you don't understand it, that you're doing me because you're from post-Soviet area, but it's basically maybe it helps you to better to capture local Malian and what he wants than, let's say, for German or American because they, they never were occupied in this sense like we. Yeah. yeah. Uh, thank you so much, and now I think we'll open the floor for questions. There must be some, thank you. Hello, I just wanted to know, like specific details, if it's possible to know as detailed as possible. When uh, Lithuanian soldiers are already selected to go to Mali, uh, how they are trained like uh, on uh, this cultural, political and social issues? What are they taught? Like how long does it take? Who gives them this knowledge? Because if, uh, like, so on these issues, yes, if it's possible. Thank you very much for your question. So, uh, I don't know how can I answer to your question in quite details, let's say so. So, first of all, I would like to mention that the whole process of selection, training, and etc., it usually takes approximately one year. So, so from 200 soldiers, usually we select 20, 30, or 40 that could be deployed, then they must overcome all this uh, medical um, checking, uh, all this physical and uh, trainings and etc. So uh, regarding to your question about this um, training on some specific uh, uh, issues or, or tasks, so we have uh, a quite good uh, support from United Nations. There are special uh, uh, manuals, special training programs on these questions. So uh, each soldier must overcome this training program, especially staff officers. Uh, there are distance learning uh, program as well as uh, uh, exams uh, in United States or in Germany. So, so if you want to be deployed, you must overcome all these trainings and uh, to pass all these tests successfully. So, did I answer your question?
I can tell my personal opinion that yes, it's not enough because we have maybe four hours of, uh, let's say, basic information about the country in Lithuania. But then we have at least uh, the model of, I think, 24 hours of, of learning about this specific country and then uh, this uh, cultural, uh, let's say, issue. So, so yes, if it's your first time uh, in international operation, it's not enough. It's, I don't know uh, what else we can do, but we are not alone, let's say. And uh, uh, usually we are together with our partners, so they give us some information, they give us some advice, they give us some instructions and, and uh, additional information. Um, and the next thing is that at the moment, uh, during our, uh, let's say, uh, contribution in Mali, our soldiers usually are deployed inside the bases. So we do not have uh, huge relations and tasks uh, outside the area. So we don't have a lot of uh, connections or interactions with local uh, authority or local populations. So I think it's from one side, okay, it would be good to have more of these trainings, but from other side, well, because of our tasks and our missions, it's quite enough because we don't have to, to interact with them, with this local population. Uh, maybe if I just can add from UN perspective, I heard that our uh, soldiers actually having uh, specific trainings on child protection and, and women protection on, on and sexual based vi uh, 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 sexual violence and conflict. But uh, in general, for example, United Nations, they are providing training on the ground, not for the pre-deployment training as, as we call it, but uh, training on the ground. So this training has really specific aspects on the cultural, uh, issues on how to interact with local communities and uh, I know that I don't know how to the military personnel but for example civilian personnel in the missions they have to 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 know the the local language not for example only French or uh, or um, English if, if, if this country uh, speaks this languages but also local languages. The, uh, there is an expectation that some uh, people in the mission should know the local language uh, as well. And uh, of course, uh, uh, as well, United Nations um, uh, also make providing the training on child pro children protection. And uh, uh, this is a very important. Uh, they are uh, teaching uh, military personnel as well as civil personnel how to uh, recognize the child soldier, how to interact with him, how to, I don't know, with interaction with him, how to call upon him to uh, go with the military, with the UN personnel, how to make protection uh, before the UNICEF will come and protect him. So it's a lot of, I don't know, specific information uh, which is provided. I don't know how uh, exactly it, it, it works on the ground and how helpful it is, but I hope that it is helpful because UN is really uh, making a lot of efforts to do this and, and each year it's making better and better. So, but how it's on the ground, maybe. Uh, Godo, you touch a uh, ages old question and militaries, especially I know from Afghanistan case, let's say militaries are notoriously against learning languages and cultural studies because you have to spend time or waste time which you can use, let's say, training to shoot and train to use new machine gun or new drone, etc., etc. And then you have a fights in military academies, let's say, should you find extra hours, let's say, for teaching cultural studies in general and then for particular missions, when you have understanding broader of cultural, ethnography, I would say, languages, it's much more easier, to, let's say, to learn for a specific country when you have some basics. But you have to cover basics. You have, let's say, to have area original studies as such. Then, let's say, you operate, you know the language, you know the dictionary, you know, let's say, some 
dynamics in different regions of the world, but it's, uh, it's not only a Lithuanian problem, it's a problem basically in all Western countries, and especially American, and Americans are establishing trends in military. So maybe French and British are much more better in that because, well, this imperial legacy, it's uh, paying back in this sense, but because in Lithuanian case, we are quite American-based approach to teaching, learning, and training officers and military. So we have this uh, always the question: to say how much time you can spend, let's say, for general training or education in regional studies, or maybe let's just if you go to Mali, you have one year, you have this intensive training for six months, you will get get this crash course on some particular issues, and then you learn on the move when you are in the area. So. Well, it, in many ways it works, it worked, and not only in Lufanian case, but I would say it's a problematic approach. But it's very difficult to convince, let's say, leading officers in the military let's say, that to spare some extra hours and to send officers to study cultural studies. Because it's the same question, what's the point? Because we're sending only 60 soldiers to Africa and the rest 18,000 are staying in Lufania. So, and you're looking from cost-benefit analysis. Sorry, but it's also true. And sometimes you have to operate in this sense. Let's say you have to find the optimal solution. But yeah, it's, but it's an old question and it's all problem and challenge, actually. I have a quick, um, a quick uh, question. Um, so a lot of the, so, so a couple of questions. First, you said you mostly stay in the base uh, when you operate. Is there a perception or any sort of tension between the local forces and those who stay in the base that, oh no, we are put in the, in the we, are, we are in danger, whereas you are not. Uh, is there that perception uh, at all to feel that we are at the frontier of the conflict and perhaps you don't actually put yourself in that position so we suffer much more uh, losses? And the second thing is, uh, one of the lessons that the US learned uh, in Iraq and Afghanistan quickly is to see that the, the, the guerrilla forces actually adapt pretty quickly than the, uh, the, the, the national forces or the multinational forces that come into fight. For example, we know that a lot of these groups are increasingly using young girls and women uh, as suicide uh, terrorists. And if we do not appreciate the cultural context where a man cannot search a woman or even be isolated with a woman, is there, uh, are there training being done uh, or even female engagement teams like the U.S. had in 2009. Of these soldiers being deployed to Africa, are any of them women at all? And, and is there, can, and that's important if more than half of the displaced people uh, are, are women and children, and if uh, a lot of these groups are increasingly using women as a strategy. Uh, I'm just interested to know the gender dynamics uh, of uh, soldiers that are being sent there, and if that is even something that is uh, coming up in conversations. Thank you for your question. So, so uh, answer to your first question about this, well, is it good to be inside the base or is it bad to be inside the base? So, so first of all, there are quite different uh, tasks during the mission, and uh, there are specific requirements, and let's say for this force protection unit, uh, there are really huge uh, requirements, and then let's say it's not the easiest task uh, during your deployment. So uh, if there are some gaps of capabilities, yeah, Lithuania always evaluate what kind of troops or what kind of contribution we can provide to this. So, so there are no good positions, there are no bad positions. There is a job that we have to do. And we are doing that job that we are ready and we are able to do. So, so I think there are no any conflicts or any indications that our soldiers are doing some, let's say, force protection uh, tasks and everything is okay with this part. With uh, talking about the sec uh, second question about, uh, let's say, uh, uh, women contribution in international operation and missions, uh, probably everyone knows that during 2000, uh, during the meeting uh, of United Nations ministers, defense ministers in 2016, uh, there was an agreement to increase uh, the number of women in international operations up to 15 percent. 
it means that there cannot be less than 15% of women in each contingent or in each United Nations mission. So, at the moment, I cannot tell you what is the overall situation, but uh, I say uh, our first contingent and, and Mali uh, Force Protection Unit, there was no any woman in this unit of 32 soldiers, but the second uh, force protection unit that started uh, its mission uh, on February, we have three uh, women uh, in this mission. So we are increasing these numbers. We are doing this and uh, uh, moreover, we have one staff officer, uh, a girl, a woman uh, in Timbuktu and she is a civil military cooperation officer. So I think it's really important when we are trying to, to have a connection with local population. So um, maybe I can finish. Yeah. I know one volunteer who wants to be in Mali and sh if everything okay, she will be on the rotation which goes in October, I think. And uh, and she said that she was kind of, I think, the fourth member of, of the girls in that mission bubble rotation. And there was a problem because it's not the Finian side. It's German side that said, let's say, it's too much. And because German side in, in command of the base, let's say, they're setting the numbers, how much girls they would like to see from Lufania because it's logistics issues, etc. So, again, so you're operating, you're operating in Mali, but you're operating in Germany framed uh, base, which uh, you have German culture, German approach. So, let's say you have to tackle with German approach and cultural issues, then you have to tackle with local Malian issues. But for my knowledge, I think she got permission and she's training and she's, uh, she's going to Mali in October. But it was interesting to listen to the let's say that she was trying to, to, let's say, to figure out, let's say, how to manage and to go to Mali because there's some obstacles, bureaucratic obstacles, basically. If I just uh, can add on, on, on women's uh, participation and peacekeeping, I know that uh, UN definitely wants to increase women participation because it's, as you told, very important uh, in, in local communities. But as I understand, the main uh, problem with this that because uh, UN peacekeeping operates with the national uh, forces, and the problem that there is no a lot of women in national military forces, and therefore that can they cannot provide uh, more women because they just don't have them. <laughs> that's that's the main problem. So I think the the first thing that we have to increase. A woman participation in our national military forces, and then we will be able to provide more women to the international peacekeeping. So we have a time for one more short question, and uh, that's it. Um, yeah, just a quick question, and I think it's uh, pretty symbolic to ask this. You know, um, I was sitting here listening to all of you, and then, uh, apart from the first probably two people, um, most of the phrases used were targets, uh, military this and that, guns, strategies, allies, Germany, France, right? So. My question is, and I would like to get a very honest answer, and if you cannot provide one, then please do not provide any answer. Um, why are we really there? What, what are we doing there? Do we really care about peace in Mali? Do we really care about peace in Afghanistan, in many other countries? Or do we care what the, how shall I say it, Emperor Donald thinks? Thank you. If you remain silent, I understand. <laughs> um, okay, for the person who uh, his interests are in war studies, so I'm very militarized in my speech, but I will say very shortly, yes, we have to go there. And not only because of his national interest, but uh, in this sense, I'm, I'm a bit cosmopolitan. Let's see, we have to help. It's uh, in many ways, 
I will be skeptical when you're talking about the peace, uh, long-term peace, sustainable peace in not in Africa or Afghanistan, but let's say, look, this peace is crumbling even in Europe, so it's a challenge, uh, but, but we have to go. Uh, otherwise, let's say, uh, these people are suffering, and it's sometimes, question is, what you can do? Okay, maybe give 10 euros, let's say, to some fund, or maybe support ministry and the government to send even 30 soldiers. Maybe that's so much we can do, but we're still doing that. So yes, uh, I'm realistic and pragmatic, but also, in, Maybe I'm reading too much about these different cultures, so we have to go. But uh, in many ways, it's uh, lots of t difficult jobs to do, and sometimes I don't know. Let's say, is there any end and light in the tunnel? But we, you, we have to try. I would this way. Let, let me add then something. Um, I feel like your aspirations—that sort of—that's the right sentiment. But I'm not sure that this is how the reality looks like. I mean, you know, back in the day when, when I was in Cairo, for example, in 2011, so right after the Arab Spring, the size of our embassy to the entire MENA region, if I'm not mistaken, was like two or three people, right? And that's not even covering Africa, that's just North Africa. Um, so it's not really that we should uh, lynch the, you know, the Lithuanian military uh, for, you know, too little, too late type of arguments. But I think it raises a much bigger point about Lithuania's role in global affairs and partnering with EU, with NATO, with the US on a broader scope. So yes, we should help. Yes, we should cooperate. I think the much bigger political issue at stake is that we should start to care about international affairs, full stop, international affairs that do not involve Russia. I mean, seriously, where, like, where, where have we been, if, if we look even at our school curriculum, you know, our, our high school history books basically end with the World War II. Well, where is China there? Where is the Middle East? Where is the same Africa? What's going on with Australia? I mean, we, uh, if we as a state do not identify significant ways to engage in the political life around the world that does not circle around Russia, we're going to lose out. So it is not fair to pin all these evils on the military missions, but it's a fact that we need to do way more than military missions. And uh, there's a lot that the civil society can do organically. You know, promoting business interests in Africa, promoting university exchanges there bringing experts in from countries that people in Lithuania do not know a lot about, uh, doing cultural events, uh, art, um, doing technological investments, uh, looking into what could genuinely benefit Lithuanian people from the point of economy, from the point of knowledge. Uh, and yes, serving side by side with our military allies is a good idea, but having, you know, 20 or 200 or probably even 2,000 soldiers somewhere in NATO missions is by no way a guarantee that if push comes to shove in terms of Russian tanks rolling across our border, that this will be the deciding point uh, whether or not NATO will help us. The big power games are, well, games is not a good word for it, but basically big power interests in every sphere are dynamic too and they do not keep count on such simplistic basis. So we should really, it, it's, it's a little bit naive to think of it in such straightforward terms. So we need to expand our thinking of participation in international relations, not just international missions. But it is a good starting point because we do need to start somewhere. It's type of question, <coughs> do we really, really uh, love Lithuania, like, like Marionas Mikutavich said? Do we really believe uh, that Americans cares about our security? Do we really believe that Americans cared about security in Cold War times? So it is, it's a question for everyone himself, I think, first of all, and about values. So Afghanistan, Mali is first of all about humans. You can name all those strategic interests, but humans, childs, actually, and those who are suffering. In Lithuania, suffers child, and, and for example, children, and, and in Afghanistan, Mali as well. So there are, you know, very, very bad things, actually. And of course, I think in this, let's say, thinking, 
we put layers, different layers of, of how, how we perceive ourselves and uh, on the basis uh, of, of what, what, how we act. And I think that, uh, let's say, with human belief, with values, it's, it's of course, uh, very much counts. And I think if, if we just uh, would uh, count in this cynical way, so uh, that uh, all those bad issues would come to Lithuania and we will be, let's say, also estimated and, let's say, executed in a, in, a, in a very bad way. So I think that it's about ourselves, how we perceive, about our values, and of course, we are having different layers of how we can act. I think it was perfectly said in this, in this manner. Thank you so much, and I think that was a very good ending point. And uh, so we're ending our discussion, and thank you for coming, and thank you for staying, and for those who are interested in Africa, uh, please come next Wednesday for uh, one more um, conference. Uh, this time is about IT and development, ICT 4D. And uh, yeah, won't be any discussions about war or uh, something else like this, but will be discussions about Africa as well. Thank you so much.